it's now the turn for us to remember Robert Wangila Napuni. Robert Wangila Napuni is one of the international sportsmen Kenya has ever produced. He was a boxer. His mother was called Elizabeth Mora, a kissy lady. She got married to Benson Maveche, a kissy gentleman. Then, due to what happens in homes, the two separated, the two divorced, if you want to call it. But in African, we can say they separated. She moved to Nairobi. When she moved to Nairobi, she brought up she she stayed as a single lady. She stayed as a single lady. And in the process, she got a son. Whether she got other kids, it is beyond my knowledge. But she got a son who is the subject of today's recording. Robert Wangira. She brought the, up this son single-handedly. Single-handedly. Now, it is not possible to go into her life to know how he, she brought up this person. Whether she was a twilight woman or she was doing business and uh, she had a affairs aside, it is hard to establish at this moment. But somehow, she got a son. For all purposes, we can say that the biological father of the boy was a Luhia from Busia. There is no question about that whether he was her only associate or there were two or more, it is not known. But it is assumed and, 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 and nobody doubts it that uh, the biological father of the boxer was a Luhia from Busia. But even though he was the father, but she brought him up single-handedly. He went through a very hard, difficult life. Some even say boundering on Chokora and so on and so on. He never went to school properly because the single mother could not afford or whatever, or uh, the life they used to stay, it became easier for him to be a Chokora or not. And you know, these Chokoras are people who, ha who live on the hard life. So when they enter sports like hand-to-hand uh, -hand, uh, hand -hand, uh, sports like Boxing, wrestling, uh, karate, so on. They usually do well because they are used to hard life on the streets. Wangila Napuni was noticed by Tasca or East African breweries or even Kenya breweries. They took him as a boxer. Those days... If you are very good in sports, it was easier for you to get a job even if you are of limited education. That is why you'll find very good sports people, footballers, boxers, call it. They ended up being joining 
companies or ministries that are associated with uh, such things. If you are a musician, you'd find yourself in maroon commandos. Such and such a thing. So he ended up in Tasca as a boxer. That is where you'd find you'd be employed as a clerk, but rarely do you do clerk work. You're always in the gym practicing. Joining Tasca Amateur Boxing Association, he was noticed by Amateur Boxing Association of Kenya, where he fought gallantly and went up to the Seoul Olympics in South Korea in 1988. He won a gold medal for Kenya, the first one, and he was internationally recognized. Coming back, you know, previously, that is 1988, but if you go back 10 to 15 years back, let's say 1978 or even 1973, if you'd have reached that stage and the scouts, professional scouts, international professional scouts wanted you, the Kenya government would block you. Kenyan government would encourage you to just be within the amateur ranks. That is why in the 70s and in the 60s, Kenyan boxers did not go for professional. They just spent their whole life as amateur boxers. But things were different in the 80s that uh, after Seoul, he had been talent spotted and those people followed him up to Nairobi. He stayed in Nairobi for a short time and went to America to be a professional boxer. When he was in America as a professional boxer, uh, you know, I've just said that uh, he was in a new environment. Those who were before him ended up as amateurs, and you know if you are an amateur, you got burnt out, You, you the, the company you are employed as a clerk, you continue being a clerk until you get old. Now he was in a new field of professional boxing. Professional boxing is funny, that when you are in your peak, you are rushed left, right, center to be, to gain money. But they do not tell you if you had grown up, <clears throat> because such things, those who went ahead usually make mistakes, and those who follow later learn from the mistakes of those who went there earlier. So, he was among the pioneers. He had no, but no, he had no Kenyan to learn from. He got burned so quickly. And people who, there are those people promotions where you are supposed to appear somewhere. Uh, you ask for the appearance fee. Now being fast, being new to the game, you ask for very little. And by the time you realize, you are already worn out. So Robert Wangila uh, from 1988, count up to 1994, 93, 94, somewhere there, he was already burnt out. Even for a good boxer, that time you are burnt out. You are supposed to have saved enough and then you take that money to invest in other things that will take care of you for the rest of his li your life. But here he was, he had not saved money and he was already burnt out and in America, life is very expensive. Very expensive. If you have a thousand dollars in America, you would find in the evening you have spent it. But if you come to a place like Africa, say Kenya, and you have a thousand dollars, the whole month you'll still have the money. So he got life there, it was very expensive, and he had no money. So he got into these small, small fights, which were many, and for somebody, a martial, a hand to hand compact. E.G. Uh, e boxing, you need to have a rest after every fight. Between fights, you are supposed to have a rest, 
But if you fight regularly, your health can deteriorate. So one time he went to he one time he went to a boxing ring and fought somebody and he collapsed in the ring. He never recovered, he was taken to the hospital and he died. So when Kenyans had you see that is the problem we have in Kenya. I don't know whether African countries also have that. You can be poor, you can stay in the slums, so and so, and nobody cares about you. But if you win a jackpot, all people who are with you, everybody will remember those who are with you in primary and on, and even relatives. And when he died, that is when now everybody started claiming him. Yes, <clears throat> In order of priority, his widow was to be given first priority. Second was his mother. But you see, people now crowded up. And, and the mother was, you see, that type of people who have stayed in slums and whatever. She had remarried to another Benson. Now the Benson who married her first was called Benson Mabeche. Now she had remarried to another Benson and these people are now confusing her. And then the people from Busia, the biological relatives of Robert Wangila, demanded his body. But let me tell you, even these people, all of them, I'm not even talking, I'm not even taking sides, all of them were interested in him in burying his body because they believed, they did not know that he, he had burned out in America and he had no money in the banks. They just said that should they bury somebody? And I think Kenyan law should take care of that. We have had cases where somebody dies and he is, he or she is uh, wastes time in the mortuary because there is this belief that whoever buries the dead body claims all the properties that the dead person has left. So I think the, 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 the constitution should be changed or the laws should be changed such that anybody can bury anybody but those who deserve get it. That is why you find widows are disturbed, cases are taken over for a long time because people believe that. Now, let us look at the whole case. Luhias demanded his body according to the Luhia tradition because his paternal relatives were Luhia, including a boxer called Modest Odor Napuni. The Luhia said that Modest Odor Napuni was related to Robert Wangila Napuni that is what Busia people said. But people from Kisi said that he admired Robert, uh, Odu, Nob, uh, Robert Odur uh, Napuni that he adapted the name, but they said that he was a Kisi. To make matters worse, Robert Wangila had two identity cards. He had two identity cards in one, you know those days you could get more than one IDs, but nowadays with your waiting card, they go to do background check. Don't try that again. He had taken one ID that he had declared that he was Robert Wangila Napuni from Busia. And he had taken another ID where he had said he was Robert Angira. There's a, there's a Kisi name called Angira, that he was Robert Angira from Kisi. But most of his documents, passport, everything, he had, and you see those two IDs oh, had different birthdays, had different birthdays, had different birthplaces. But most of the things that he used, most of the things that he used, documentation and everything, uh, the Busia. He he's used the Busia ID. 
And so the lawyers wanted to, to claim him because of his biological paternal lineage. The kisses, you know, Madam Elizabeth Mora was confused. First of all, she presented Benson Mapeche as Robert Wangila's father. Then later, she came up and came with the second Benson, whose surname I've forgotten, and said that that was Robert Wangila's father. Well, everybody was right. <laughs> there is a times when, as an intelligence officer, an NIS fellow will tell you everybody's right. They are right this way. Busia was right because, uh, according to Luya tradition, the the ma the boy had his paternal relationship in Luhia land. The kisses were right because according to the Kisi tradition, when Elizabeth Mora got married, it is Benson Mabeche who went to her parents' place and paid dowry. So according to Kisi tradition, if you marry a woman who has be, who's parents have received the dowry, you are supposed to go there and demand that the parents refund the dowry. Or you go and negotiate with her former husband and refund it to him. But if you don't, if a kissy, can I say eunuch, marries 20 women, and just stays there and distributes those women and they, 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 they come up each with 20 kids, that is 400 kids. In the Kisi tradition, the kids belong to the person who paid the dowry, according to Kisi tradition. According to Luhia tradition, the kids belong to the biological father. And this other ben, second Benson, was claiming to be the father because he was the current husband to Elizabeth Mora. Now, somebody said that when, when you have a court session, the, the two sides, the accused and the prosecution, or even the respondent and the... They both know the truth. The person who is on trial is the judicial officer, the magistrate or the judge. You are not there. <laughs> you don't even know the place. But you are relying on evidence and you are relying on the law to make your judgment. So it is you who is on trial, not the parties interested. Because they know the truth and they have decided to come and... This one extends the truth this side, this one extends the truth this side. So it is for you to find the middle line. The judge, whom I've forgotten but was very good, he decided this way. That Robert Wangira was a lawyer from Busia. Because the law is superior to the traditions. And the law recognizes the biological father unless and until you have adopted the child by law. And lastly, he said that uh, since Wangira had converted into Islam before dying, you know, conversion can even be in a, a day. Yes. So long as the person, when doing so, was mentally stable or anything, you do something the following day, you die, it is legally recognized. So it is. it was recognized that before he died, he had converted to Islam. So uh, he, he, the, the, the judge said that Robert Wangila be buried in Karyoko Muslim uh, cemetery as a Muslim who was a Luhia by tribe. And later on, people came to get their surprise that he had nothing in his account. That is life. Circumcised la vie, as the French say. <laughs>